A massive series of changes to Warhammer 40,000. Matched play just dropped in the January FAQ this past week. And in addition to some quality of life changes and small corrections, a bunch of big erratas have totally shaken up the 40k metagame and potentially skyrocketed some fringe factions like Drukari and, especially for me, Tyranids directly into the spotlight. So let's talk about them. What's up folks, welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi. Thanks for watching this video and it is an exciting time to be playing 40k right now because a lot of our prayers have been answered with the January FAQ changes being made to not only 40k and the match play rules in general, but also specifically the GT 2020 format with enormous overhauls to how primary objectives are scored to some of the most egregious secondary objectives and enormous points changes that have really revamped the face of the 40k metagame. Before we start talking about these erratas and the changes that they herald for especially my favorite faction, Tyranids, a couple housekeeping things to get behind. First off, if you haven't heard yet, January 23rd is going to be the start of the T5S2 Season 2 Invitational Tournament. If you like competitive 40k or just really good games of 40k in general, if you like prizes, if you like competition, we are going to be streaming a ridiculous number of games of Warhammer 40,000 from some of the best players in the world over from the T5S2 tournament series. The Seasonal Invitational is a biannual tournament that takes the top 16 people from the global standings and pits them against each other across six rounds of 40k. We're going to be playing a ton of and we're going to be streaming almost every single one of this is going to be some awesome 40k. So make sure to mark your calendars. They will be streamed both on this channel and over on twitch.tv slash tactical tortoise TV. So check the both of those out. Give us a subscribe and a follow if you want to get notified when those start going live. But exciting times. And I'm psyched to watch some sick 40k that also is going to make use of the changes that we're talking about here. So namely, what are the big changes that happened? There's been a lot of uh, small clerical changes and clarifications to things. Things like the combination of Always Strikes First and Always Strikes Last abilities. Clarifications to units like Infiltrators that prevent reserves from setting up around them. And a lot of rules that had really small, maybe nitpicky loopholes in them have been cleared away. It's clear that the Warhammer Community team, or at least the FAQ team, is keeping tabs on these holes that the community at large are finding in the game, and they're doing their best to seal them up. Some of the big, I think, um, some of the big changes that have been made include a change to any abilities that allow you to move outside of the movement phase and any abilities that say you move as if it were the movement phase. Those have all been clarified to lock that move into a standard move. So you can no longer use an effect like Hive Commander or Twilight Path to fall back out of combat or advance, for example. That is a big nerf for a lot of the factions we're going to be talking about here, Harlequins in, in particular, and also Tyranids. Obviously, Tyranids will use a lot of double move abilities, namely Swarm Lord, to move again. And those are going to be a little bit less effective. AP reducing effects have been clarified. There was some confusion and different tournaments ruled the interaction between an AP bonus like a Combat Doctrine or Storm of Fire versus an AP reduction effect like Oramite and Adamantium or Enhanced Resistance. That's just been clarified to say that AP reduction effects always take into account the final AP value of the weapon attacking them. So there's never any weird confusion where you can ignore AP and then get bonus AP from Doctrines or something like that. For Tyranid specifically, there's now a rule actually allowing you to use a Tyrannocyte to bring a monster to the table. If your base is too large to fit within the three inches that you would normally be allowed to disembark into, then you can just disembark within one inch of the transport instead. And last, but certainly not least, some huge changes happened to the GT 2020 format specifically, which if you've been watching the channel at all, that's mostly what we play over here on Tactical Tortoise. Bring It Down has been nerfed basically to move all of the segments of scoring down by one point. So if you kill a small vehicle, 10 wounds or below, you'll get one point. If you kill a medium sized vehicle between, between 11 and 19 wounds, you will get two points. And if you kill a big vehicle that's 20 plus wounds, then you'll get three points. Unlike the two you got for killing a small vehicle and the three you got for killing a big vehicle as it worked in the past. Tank heavy armies that used to punish you significantly, especially if, for example, you're playing Imperial Guard and you brought a lot of chimeras with guardsmen inside them, you would give up thin their ranks, both on the vehicles and the infantry, and then all 
also two or three points for bring it down for each of those vehicles you would just like lose 30 secondary points instantaneously that's no longer the case then their ranks is still going to be brutal but bring it down much more reasonable and it's very difficult to max it out even against a monster or vehicle heavy list you have to kill eight monsters or vehicles to get the full 15 points out of this if you're getting two points apiece that's crazy Last, but certainly not least, Abhor the Witch was nerfed to give up less VPs when you kill Psykers and stuff like that. Thank goodness, I still don't really agree with the inclusion of Abhor the Witch in the game to begin with, but the fact that it is a much less attractive choice now that it doesn't give you a full 15 VPs if all you do is kill three characters, that feels a lot better to me. We're going to talk about Tyranids a lot in this video, and uh, Hive Tyrants have gotten a, a bunch of nerfs. Both of these are included in those. Hive Tyrants now give a full three victory points less for being killed. One from Bring It Down, two from Abhor the Witch, since you only get three for killing a character. Sick! They used to give up nine victory points if you took the correct combination of secondaries. Now they can only give up six, and a lot of lists are not going to be very viable to pick all three of those against anyway. So, man, it feels good right now. It feels good to be a Tyranid player, and I think just generally really uh, the, the meta game of 40k is going to be a lot more balanced after this change. The other huge change was an alteration to the primary objective scoring in the GT 2020 format. Now, instead of the second player scoring at the top of their turn on round five, they score at the end of their turn. It's a little bit hard to conceptualize, but what that means is that you get to round five, the first player has their turn, and at their command phase, they score their points as normal for all the objectives that they were standing on basically at the end of round four. Then you go to the second player's turn on round five. They score zero points in their command phase, but they get to move their entire army, potentially moving on to objectives to contest them or take them from their opponent to try to get hold more, then score their primary objectives at the end of the game, which means that there are a lot more points up for grabs for the second player if they are able to survive to the end of the game. That still means that if you are going first, there's still a big advantage. Obviously, the standard primary objective scoring is going to favor you throughout the course of the game, and you're going to get the first ability to attack the opponent to remove some of their models. But if the player going second is able to start in a defensive position and not lose too hard on attrition, especially if they're a fast army, once you get to that last turn, assuming you have enough left, it should be pretty easy for you to grab a 15 point primary turn on the last turn of the game. While this probably won't change very much the first versus second dichotomy as a whole, what it will do is in very close games, the second player, especially if they have objective secured, fast objective secured models left on the table, which means uh, you might be incentivized to play a little bit more cagey if you're the second player. The second player will be able to get a boost of primary objective points right at the end of the game and can potentially grab back those close games that they're just barely losing. This, in general, makes the game seem way more interesting and fun to me since going second becomes its own little mini game where if you can get 30 objective points and survive until the last round, three objective points isn't too hard potentially control or contest two objectives at the end of your turn boom a 15 point primary you grab you know max on primary and if you're close with your opponent boom you clinch it with that uh with a sweet maneuver on the last turn really cool really cool change i don't quite think that it's gonna totally change the uh, the dichotomy i think first player is still very much advantaged especially in a lot of matchups that are very alpha strike oriented but that said it gives the second player some tools in their toolbox to fight back and that's what we need. In conjunction with that change, there was another minor change to the role to go first in uh, GT 2020. If you win the role to go first, you automatically take the first turn. So with this buff to the second player going, you cannot then build your game plan around that and try to take second turn. It's straight up 50-50 who goes first. It's totally random. Now, a lot of points changes also happened. Not every faction was hit evenly. And uh, I think there's a lot of like little niggly changes the community is going to unearth as this new 2021 meta kind of starts to evolve. But I'll talk about some factions that between the points changes and the core rules changes have had a pretty big change. Drakari, number one on the list, got absolutely enormous point changes. They are staring right down the barrel of a new codex, so I imagine that these points changes are sort of to prepare for that, and it looks like a lot of the points changes that were included in the errata are using new codex units and data sheets. There are some units that were included in the MFM errata uh, that do not exist in the game yet. For example, uh, Dark Angel's got a new, probably lieutenant equivalent model that doesn't have a data sheet yet, but we do have a points cost for it, so we know that it's probably gonna be in the new codex. But Drukari, 
Got some insane point changes, some of which may be wrong, but uh, Reaver Jet Bikes dropped to 10 points. You can take 27 of them in a list for 270 points. And uh, their two wounds toughness four, they're ridiculously fast, they can engage guns. There's not many lists you wouldn't start with, with two or three units of these guys. They seem incredible for that price. Rax, also a very resilient infantry option with objective secured. They're down to eight points a model. You can take units of 20 of them. And you can use Black Cornucopia, their green time style strat, to pull them back onto the table. That seems really good. Gray Knights, also some really interesting changes in conjunction with the changed secondaries. They were probably the number one faction that got targeted by Abhor the Witch. And now Abhor the Witch just generally scores less points. So they're going to give up less uh, points on that secondary. We also had a change to the While We Stand We Fight secondary, I didn't mention. That changed the secondary from targeting the most expensive models in your army to targeting the most expensive units. That means for a lot of factions like Harlequins and most factions in general, you could build your list such that your most expensive units were your characters, which are very hard to hit, and use them very defensively to get 10 or 15 points very consistently on While We Stand We Fight. That's no longer the, an option because a lot of times your larger units, your more frontline units will be more expensive than those characters, which means that you're disincentivized from taking those. But for a faction like Grey Knights that already plays very defensively and very passively and has enormous hard to kill units that are monumentally expensive and they can concentrate a lot of defensive buffs on to make them ridiculously hard to kill. I mean, we're talking about Paladins. It's, it's Paladins, you know, those guys. That change seems awesome for Grey Knights. Astro Militarum, I mentioned before, they got a lot of points changes, a lot of things went down, and the Bring It Down change, really good for them. And a couple nerfs as well, the top two factions in the game are arguably Harlequins and Sororitas. Sororitas got slight nerfs in terms of points changes, a couple of their most powerful units went up. However, a lot of times they would bring armies that were susceptible to Bring It Down, and the Bring It Down change is good for them, so it's not 100% bad for, Harle for Sororitas. Harlequins, on the other hand, had a lot of double moving effects, which have been nerfed by the changes to double moving. According to an existing errata, unless a Harlequin unit has already fallen back previously in the turn, once they are targeted with Twilight Pathways, for example, going first, they cannot then advance. So the combo to double Prismatic Blur, two units of Skyweavers, and sort of body block your opponent into their deployment zone is no longer viable. Only one of those will get the three plus invulnerable save from advancing. They also very commonly took While We Stand We Fight because they could put their characters in transports and just hide them for the entire game to very reliably get a bunch of points off that. Can't do that anymore. Now, if you're taking Skyweavers or large player troops, those are gonna be your While We Stand targets, and those are always dead by the end of the game. <laughs> those guys uh, have a very low vapor pressure. But if you have watched this channel for any length of time, you know that the faction that I'm most interested in and most excited about, and which I'm gonna spend the rest of this video talking about, is Tyranids. Oh my god, is it like a brave new world for Tyranids after these changes? Not only because Tyranids were very expressly targeted with some insane points reduction, but also most of these secondary changes and primary objective uh, scoring changes are very beneficial for Tyranids. Tyranids rely a ton on monsters. A lot of the most popular lists are the big Tyranid monster mash builds. Bring it down, scoring almost half as many points against them is phenomenal. Tyranids rely a lot on Psykers and have a lot of Psykers that cannot be lookout served for, so Abhor the Witch was very good against them. Unfortunately, Tyranids actually made good use of what we stand we fight, like Neurothropes are ridiculously hard to peel out of your army, and a lot of times they're the most expensive models. So, unfortunately, you win some, you lose some. So let's talk about specifically the things that have changed for Tyranids and what it means for the faction. First off, one of the biggest weaknesses of Tyranids in the past has been a weakness to horde armies. A lot of the Tyranid kind of high volume melee stuff got really hit in the original release of the Munitorum Field Manual. Um, I mean, sp specifically Gene Stealers. A lot of times Tyranids could win against horde armies just off the back of cracking Gene Stealers, like jumping around the table and killing your opponent's entire army. And unfortunately, that's just not the case in 9th edition. However, a lot of the alternative options that Tyranids have to kill those models got a points decrease. Some ancillary stuff like Raveners, which I think are an interesting tech piece uh, specifically against large volumes of units. But I think the most important two are Devourer Termagants, which have dropped a full two points down to seven points a model. Warriors. Devourer Termagants are a pretty reasonable pick and can combo into a lot of really interesting things. If you take them in High Fleet Jormungandr, the Jormungandr's specific psychic power can give them full rerolls when they come onto the table against a specific enemy unit. That means that you can strategic reserve and maybe bring in a unit with Pheromone Trail next to a Lictor. You can bring them in a Tyrannocyte, or you can just, you know, normally strategic reserve them. Come in with a, a Moloch, maybe? A, a big old Trigon? And you get full rerolls to hit with those guys pretty good. Being Termagants, they also benefit from... Adaptive Exoskeleton to get them a 6 plus invulnerable save if you really want to do that. You can just sort of plant them on the table and embed them into a Gaunt Carpet list. They're not 
that much more expensive than a, a regular termagant or a hormagant uh, so you don't lose too much volume but what you do get is, is a lot of killing power especially against things like orc boys which are really good at killing other tiered infantry and the termagants can really scythe through very quickly using those combos you can also then you know single mind annihilation the unit to get double taps and if they're a large enough unit they reroll their ones to wound which is pretty effective i think i like the idea of putting a unit of 20 in a tyrannocyte maybe that you can build that into a jormungandr patrol it just costs you the two cp for that detachment and then the Neurothrope can run around and smite stuff until it's time for the Tyrannocyte to come in. You drop that guy down and for 230-ish points, he can fling out a whole bunch of Death Spitter or Barb Strangler shots. In addition to 60 shots from uh, from a unit of 20 Termagants, I think that's pretty reasonable. If you dynamic camouflage them, they actually go to a 4 plus save against return shooting, which is like kind of cute, I guess. <laughs> So I think that Devour Gants, being a toughness three six up save model, were ridiculously expensive in with the previous point cost. They were nine points a model, which was just too many. And seven points a model is much more reasonable, and I think they're a, a very reasonable pick that you can you can put on the table in a lot greater numbers now. Speaking of greater numbers, though, I think the biggest winner out of all of these is the the lowly Tyranid Warrior, which had a over twenty percent points decrease in this errata. What the heck? They dropped from 21 points a model with no upgrades to 17. They can still just take multiple pairs of Scything Talons and not spend any additional points. So what you're getting is three wounds, toughness four, with a four plus save for less than the cost of a tactical Space Marine. With four attacks, rerolling ones to hit in melee. They're not amazing, but man, what an incredible troops choice we have gotten here. I was already of the opinion that I think Tyranid Warriors are one of the best units in the Codex, especially in conjunction with the Adaptive Physiology uh, for Enhanced Resistance for a Ignore AP 1 and 2. They are certainly one of the units in Tyranids that can stick around on the table for longer. And uh, wow, we just got a huge, enormous points decrease to that combo. I even think that there's room in Tyranid lists for additional units of Warriors. You can bring units of five for 85 points. You can bring units of three in place of a, a Termagant unit for just 51 points if that toughness four is really meaningful to you. And they just make obnoxious to kill objective holders. Five Tyranid Warriors sitting on an objective in cover is very difficult to kill for almost any indirect fire in the game. And they can even fight a lot of sort of light outflanking units pretty well. I think there's also an interesting list that spams Tyranid Warriors where you can take 30 or 40 of them in an army. You can give them the plus one AP for biometallic cysts on their scything talons. And you just get a full army of models that can actually go and fight things like orc boys and, and potentially trade up. And not to mention just putting these things in your list will just generically make you better against toughness three or lightly armored toughness four infantry. A Harlequin player troop, you know, piling out of a Star Weaver is going to have to think twice about where it wants to stand if you could just pile 20 Tyranid Warrior attacks into them and kill them immediately if they do that. And that's not really something the Tyranids have done before. They've, they've had to rely on their psychic powers and their shooting to pick off these smaller units, and it just hasn't been efficient. And Tyranid Warriors have four attacks for 17 points a model at a very reasonable defensive stat line. I think these have gone from one of the best units in the Codex to maybe the number one. I am so psyched. And even the lists that existed with the two units of Tyranid Warriors of them have dropped almost 60 points just out of the gate. Enjoy your like free two units of Rippers that you just get in your list for not doing anything. Speaking of which, moving down to the Elite slot, Hive Guard also dropped five points a model, which means that any of the Tyranid gun line list you're looking at two units of hive guard or one unit of hive guard supporting other tyranid guns those have also gotten more efficient in my recent how to play tyranids video i talk about i think the at that time the most efficient tyranid list which is two units of hive guard two exocrines two units of warriors with that same combo as well as a couple smattering of other units in the swarm lord etc and that list dropped like over 120 points just overnight now, I think the meta is a little bit more toxic to that style of list than it was when the that video came out. There were a lot more foot space marines at the time, I think evidenced by that video itself. And uh, that army just absolutely rips up that style of space marine. But at the upper echelon of the meta right now, the focus is on a lot faster units. In space marine armies, we're, you know, starting each army with three units of jetpack or vanguard veterans, etc. And obviously the two best factions in the game are Harlequins and Sororitas, both of which are incredibly fast and can get into those castles very quickly. So I'm not 100% sure that that's the direction you want to go in. But if you do, you get a bunch of free points. You just get like a like three free units in your list. <laughs> 
The other big winner in this change was the Lowly Hive Tyrant. The Hive Tyrants dropped 15 to 20 points depending on your build, and also, like I mentioned right at the top, give up way less victory points if you take them. I already like Smashy Hive Tyrants, I think. Despite the fact that they, they pull an adaptive physiology away from your warriors, a unit that's so incredibly fast, they can scalpel out the units in your opponent's army that are going to be very dangerous to you. If you're up against Eradicators or Plasma Inceptors or something like that, and you can just jump a Hive Tyrant into their army and kill them and overrun out, you're golden. And the fact that those are just more efficient and bleed less victory points over the course of the game is just money. Now that said, there were a couple nerfs to Tyranids. Obviously, I mentioned the Swarmlord nerf. That was just the change to the double moving abilities rule. So it's a blanket rule, but affects Swarmlord. Oh, hey, it's editing Trevi here to correct a mistake that recording Trevi made earlier in this video that uh, was then pointed out to me and made me look very bad. I thought originally the Hive Commander was nerfed so that you couldn't advance when you use the Hive Commander move, and it was very kindly pointed out to me that Hive Commander specifies that you are allowed to advance. There is a little bit of a nerf in that it looks like you won't be able to fall back with it, which is some pretty sweet tech, especially if you had psychers like Zonethropes or Neurothropes that were up in the front lines. But egg on my face, I played like like six games <laughs> not advancing on my Hive Commander moves and complaining about it, and it turns out I could, just could have been advancing those the whole time. Anyway, let's just take this moment to reflect on the stupidity of original recording Trevi not looking up the Hive Commander rule before talking about how it was nerfed into the dirt uh, ad nauseum. Uh, recording Trevi, you dumbass. Anyway, back to the video. That is in stark contrast to Metabolic Overdrive, which, while it allows you to move again and would normally be subject to these restrictions, the advanced rules add to your movement until the end of that current phase. So because Metabolic Overdrive triggers immediately after they move, they are actually not subject to the same restrictions. You cannot then advance again, which you couldn't do uh, per FAQ in the past, but you retain the advance role that you used for your first move, despite the fact that they're not actually advancing again. So anyway, this has been a bit of a, a long and rambly video, so let's talk about some final thoughts on the position of Tyranids in the metagame and going forward. I'm personally very high on Tyranids right now. I have a video coming out later this week where I talked to Valdor from the community who does a lot of math and stuff like that. And we talked about a conclusive ranking in 2021 for the factions in Warhammer 40k. And we put Tyranids right around the middle of the middle of the road. And I think that that is a pretty good place for Tyranids. However, with these changes, they make a lot more efficient armies. The downside is that Tyranids have a single big weakness and one that it's going to be very difficult for the faction to overcome, and that is especially ranged Alpha Strikes, or units that are able to trade up against the large monsters and the large units that Tyranids are bringing. And those are generally some of the most powerful lists in the game. I'm not sure that even with these changes, Tyranids have the beef to overcome that. They just don't have that many defensive capabilities. Like, they can give you minus one to hit, they can be high toughness, maybe a minus one strength is in there somewhere. But in general, like if you're getting hit with a thousand grav cannons or something like that, it's probably going to be pulling your Dimacarons and stuff off the table. And it's going to be very difficult for you to swing back into that opponent's army. That said, your army is going to be much more efficient. And most armies, especially the ones that are bringing warriors, are going to find that they have, you know, 60 to 80 additional points that they can squeeze in a couple key toolbox units, things like rippers, things like lictors, models that can max out your engagement all fronts, that can max out your deploy scramblers, and then fight for backline objectives. Tyranids are already good at playing sort of a flank game that's very finesse oriented where they can run around the table and pull your opponents off of objectives in the backline where they really want to be holding them. And this just makes them a lot more efficient at that. So there's like a level of player expression that Tyranids are going to be able to bring the, to the table, which is greater than what they had before. I don't think that breaks them into the top of the metagame, but I do think that puts them right around the top of sort of the, the middle of the road. They're like a solid tier two army. I think going forward, Tyranid Warriors, at least for me, are probably the backbone of every list I create. They're, they're just so efficient for toughness for wounds. And while the model count's relatively low, that's not a huge deal, especially when they can fight other objective secured infantry pretty effectively. I already was adding like the 18 enhanced resistance warriors to all of my lists essentially to hold objectives in the front line. But now I'm thinking that adding units of three or units of five Tyranid warriors to hold objectives in the back is very good. They're difficult to take out. They can fight deep strikers and scrambler deployers pretty well. And they have a small footprint. So if they want to deploy scramblers or perform actions themselves, they can do that pretty rel reliably. When the Forge World Imperial Armor Compendium came out, I actually wasn't super thrilled with the options, the Forge World options the Tyranids got. Namely, the Scythe Tyra Duel and the Dimacaron were both seeing a ton of play, and I wasn't sure I was super into it. 
the monster mash lists were okay, but they tended to be very aggressive and kind of, they could fall apart very easily and give up a lot of points on bring it down. But the changes to bring it down means that you can play those monsters much more aggressively and you don't really have to baby them quite as much because your opponent's going to have a hard time actually maxing out that secondary against most Tyranid archetypes. That means that you can drop your three Dimacarons directly on the front line of the table and ram them directly into your opponent's army. And even if they don't kill enough stuff, they can box your opponent into their deployment zone for long enough that your guns are able to do work, that your warriors are able to do work. And even if you lose all three Dimacarons, it's only six VP. So the fact that you can play these specialized Tyranid lists much more aggressively feels so good to me. And I do think that those are going to be angling towards the top tier of Tyranid archetypes. And speaking of Tyranid archetypes, it's not really something that I really considered Tyranids having in the past. I think there were one or two lists that were relatively efficient, but it was kind of a bunch of different lists that were made out of the same three or four units. However, with these changes, I feel like Tyranids probably have three or four viable different list builds that they can build the core of their list around and makes for vastly different experiences. I think the gunline Tyranids are still very good. We'll see if that continues if the damage reduction meta uh, comes into as full effect as everyone's expecting. Tyranids have a lot of damage to guns, which will be a little bit awkward to play with. The aggressive melee Tyranids, I think, is very good, and I think there's some interesting play with Mazd Warriors or Mazd Gants, especially now that you can fit in Dev Gants into a Gant carpet, like I mentioned before, and have actually a little bit of damage output in that uh, Horde list as well. Just today, I even played a list with a Tyranid Prime in it, and I won? Like, what is that? What's happening to this faction? So all in all, I'm so excited for Tyranids going on to the future. The game feels much more open, and there's a lot more experimentation in the faction to be done. And I think there's some technology that the community hasn't even really settled on yet that is going to make them a lot better into a lot of the most powerful matchups in the metagame. And I do think that Tyranids are a contender for those tournament winning lists, those GT winning lists, as long as maybe they get some good matchups or they can build a list that can fight the, the very top crust of the meta. I do think the Tyranids really have what it takes to compete. So anyway, thanks for watching. Also, big thanks to my patrons over at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. If you want to join up over there, you get early access to almost all the videos that we do here, as well as some additional content, which is pretty cool. You get early access to T5S2 events. And I'll remind you again, mark your calendars. January 23rd is when invitational coverage will begin, both here on youtube.com slash tactical tortoise and over at twitch.tv slash tactical tortoise TV. Follow us there, and we're going to have so much awesome games of 40k. Also, the number one spot in T5S2 right now, the number one seed currently going into the Invitational, all Tyranid player. So, amazing. We're, we're really doing it, ladies and gentlemen. The bugs are making it. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.